Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, this is awesome. Sorry, I am much less articulate than Ed is, so I'm going to try my best. Um, and I talk really quickly, too, so I will try to tone that down. Um, where am I? Okay, here I am. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Kyle, and I work at a company called Shopify, which you may have heard of, um, potentially. Uh, so Shopify is based not here in San Francisco, which uh, you probably thought it was because it's a tech company. It's actually based in Ottawa, Canada, which is the capital of Canada. Uh, and when I talk to people about Shopify, there's a few things that they usually get wrong about us. The first of which is that we're not Spotify. This is like the <laughs> most common mistake that people make about Shopify. Uh, it happens enough that we get it in interviews even, like somebody will come in and tell me the fav their favorite music or something like that. I'm just like, cool. Uh, the next thing you might not know about us is that we're actually way more than just a checkout. So if you've bought something on the internet, you've actually probably bought something through Shopify as long as you didn't buy it on Amazon. Uh, we have 600,000 merchants that use our uh, product every day to run their businesses, which is really exciting. But this is the thing that most people recognize us for because this is the thing that most consumers interact with. But our product actually looks like this. And this is my store, so it's not doing too well. But. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is our product, and it's actually really big. Uh, this is what most of the people at Shopify work on. It, it covers a large part of uh, running a business on the internet, which is really exciting. And to do that, uh, we need to be kind of big. So this is another thing that's really surprising to people. Uh, and I mean, yes, it is Canada's definition of big, but I think it's still big. We're about 3,000 people now at Shopify, which is insane to me. Uh, and our UX team is 300 people. So that's content strategists, researchers, front-end developers, and designers. We're a really big team, which is, which is kind of crazy. And the other crazy thing is that we got big really quickly, in my opinion, or at least quick for me. Uh, so I joined Shopify three years ago, uh, and the UX team was, was big then. We were 55 people, I think. So in the past three years, we've grown about six times, which is insane. And the company's grown at the same rate. So with that much scale, it became pretty obvious that we needed something like a design system. So how many people here are familiar with Polaris? I mean, thank you. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, OK. Um, I, that's so surprising to me, but also really fucking amazing. So that's awesome. I think the external recognition of Polaris has been, has been really, really cool. Like, we released it last year. We got a bunch of uh, nice comments from people. It was really, really awesome. It felt really good. But uh, we were still at the fake it till you make it stage. So that was, uh, it's, it's funny to see it up there as a, as a symbol, but it's cool. Um, the really important thing for us, though, wasn't that external recognition. Obviously, that's not why we're building our design systems. Uh, it was its internal success. Uh, and luckily for us, by all accounts, Shop or Polaris has been a really big internal success for Shopify as well. Since we launched it in May last year, we've seen nearly 100% adoption of Polaris across the company, which is really, really, really cool. Uh, product managers reference it. Engineering managers reference it. It's become this really uh, important source of alignment for the company. So this talk isn't about Polaris being great. Uh, it's not about the successes we've seen. It's actually about all of the costs of that success. So uh, while Ed did a really good job about hyping you up for why you should have a design system, I'm now going to bring us back down a little bit and talk about all of the problems you're going to encounter once you do have one. Uh, and I was always compared to TumTum -tum when I was little, so this is why <laughs> Three Ninjas is on here. Um, so when we set up Polaris, I think one of the big problems that we had was we didn't really account for the cost of our success. We didn't think about how our system would need to change or how our system would even change it on its own once it was done. And what I've learned since then is that systems really come up with a life of their own. And I think if I had talked to myself like a year ago, I probably would have seen a lot of these things coming if I had really stopped to think about it. But we didn't stop to think about it. We just were pushing so hard on getting the thing done, on launching it to a point where we felt like it would kind of just go off on its own, uh, that we didn't think about planning for all of these problems. So that's what I'm here to talk to you tonight about, is what are some problems you might encounter when you launch your system? Uh, and I'm going to use Polaris as an example for that. So the first lesson that I have is that when you're there, what do I say? Wait, when you get there, you're still not there. I can't see my slides here, so I have to look back here. I'm sorry. Uh, and there in this case is having launched a design system. So in my view, when we were going to launch Polaris, uh, we were going to launch it, and then it would kind of just evolve on its own. Uh, it wasn't going to require too much work uh, to continue to maintain because we had done so much work just to get it there in the first place. And I think that's what we're all striving for, is this point where your system kind of just uh, is out there, everybody's using it, and you can kind of apply a little bit of effort and keep it going. But the truth is, is that your design system is, is never going to be done. 
and the work just seems to accelerate and accelerate after you launch it. So yeah, the, basically what ends up happening is you get to a point where your design system actually needs more people on it just to maintain the system than it did to build it in the first place, which is, which is kind of terrifying. So design systems weren't new to Shopify when I joined. We actually had a system to start out with. Uh, it was a team of two designers, about six developers. Uh, they had built this really awesome UI kit in Sketch. It looked like this. It looks like it was built three years ago, but I mean, it, looks, it looked like this. Uh, and it had basically every component in it. You could pull them into your Sketch files. You could do, uh, do what you needed to do. It was pretty useful. We also had a website. It's an internal website with a style guide and a component library. It had all of the components in it, as well as instructions on contributing your own components. This by all accounts really good. And our designers used the UI kit, except they all had a slightly different version of it because they'd modify it to meet their needs. And maybe updates would get pushed out like every month or so with new components. But since their UI kit was different, they weren't going to pull those components in. So then they get out of date, and maybe you'd pull different pieces here and there. And developers really loved all of the components that we built, like really loved them. But they always found that they had to slightly modify them. So if you went into the code itself, you'd find like new CSS for them or Snowflake different changes to the component or just like some subtle variations in there. So while it was close, it wasn't quite exact. And the style guide was really cool, except the style guide always looked different than the UI kit because nobody knew if the UI kit was the source of truth or the style guide was the source of truth. If a component looked right in the style guide, but it didn't look right in the UI kit, who was wrong? And if it didn't look right in the website, looked different from both of those, then like what do you do then? So all of that to say, it's a lot of caveats, but the truth is the design system worked at this point. And I think the system we had worked because we were still a relatively small team. We were about probably 55 designers, like I said, or, and content strategists, researchers. And it worked because we could talk to each other. We knew sort of why we were making the decisions we were making. We could look at something, and if it was slightly different, we could talk to each other and say, like, oh, we should really bring these things together. But as we started to grow, and as we started to grow quickly, the system started to fall apart. That system stopped working as well. So our answer to this, after I think a lot of, I mean, I make it, I'm going to make it sound really, uh, anyways, we, we basically dismantled the team. We were like, no more systems team. This doesn't exist anymore. Instead, uh, what we did was we took those two designers that were on it, and we put them onto project teams. We took those six developers, and we spread them out throughout the company. And we said, OK, UX team, the system is now everyone's responsibility. You all have to contribute to it. You all have to talk to each other. You all have to make sure that you're maintaining its health together. And we put a lot of responsibility on our UX leads, especially, to make sure that they were doing the connective work between our teams. But for the most part, we kind of just said, like, no more. Uh, we kept the tools around. Those were still there. But we had democratized kind of the idea of contribution, and we had democratized the idea of caring about the system. And this actually worked. So that's kind of crazy. It worked. But the thing that we realized when we did it is that the tools that we create can actually start to feel like the system itself. And it's not true. The tools are just abstractions that represent the system that you already have at your company. So the real system is the shared language that we all have when we talk to each other about the way that we design. So it's the reason that we use buttons on the right instead of buttons on the left. It's the reasons that we use an X in our modal instead of a cancel button. It's all of those decisions together that really make up what our design system is. And if we focus too much on our tools, we start to pay attention to the wrong things. So I like to use a metaphor of language to talk about this. In the English language, words are constantly changing meaning. We're constantly adding new words. Uh, it's changing all the time. But for some reason, we're still able to communicate every single day and make sense of what we're trying to talk about. And on the other hand, we have these dictionaries. And dictionaries are the tools of the design system of language. And all dictionaries are are a snapshot in time of what that design system looks like or what that language looks like. So it describes all of the words and all of the meanings at that particular point in time. So the only use dictionaries have are a reference point. You can't enforce a dictionary. It would be really dumb for you to tell me that I can't use a word because it's not in the dictionary in front of you, or that you don't understand me because it's not in that dictionary. So that's not the way that design systems should work either. Systems need to evolve and change constantly. And really, what's happening is whenever you're, uh, the people in your company are using your design system, they're going to be evolving it and changing it as they go. So your tools need to become representations of that. So we kind of followed the system of uh, constant collaboration and really democratizing that contribution to the system. And what we ended up with was really great internally consistent projects but only, and products, but only within their silos. So our web product was pretty consistent, and our, our mobile product was pretty consistent, and our point of sale product was pretty consistent, because those are the people that talk to each other the most. But when we zoomed out and looked at our products against each other, none of them really looked the same. 
And man, they look old now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I still like the bell, though. It's nice. Uh, so our, we, we set a new goal for ourselves. We said, OK, now that we know we can do this on a specific team, how do we do it for the whole company? How do we make all of the designers that we have? And at this point, let's say it's uh, 200 UXers. How do we make all of the people working on all of these products work in the same way? How do we make it look like it was designed by one person? So what we did was we reassembled the team. We took a new approach. We said, don't focus on the tools. Instead, focus on advocacy and education. Go spend time with the teams that are building these things. Learn about why they aren't succeeding. And also, try to build some kind of like meta-level system stuff. So figure out why we use different colors everywhere. Figure out why we use different illustration styles everywhere. Figure out why our, I don't even know, type scale is completely different everywhere. And so once we did that, we started to get a better sense that we could actually make a difference. So on, I want to say it was like February 1st of last year, uh, a friend of mine uh, and I stood up in front of the entire company, so about 2,500 people or so, and we said, uh, in three months, this will look completely different. We'll have launched a new style guide, and we're going to completely change the way this looked. None of this work had been done at this point. We just stood up in front of the company and said we were going to do it. So that's how we got our buy-in, <laughs> was we basically forced it in, in, uh, into existence. Um, but that was faking it for us. That was the way that we faked it until we made it. Because we, and what ended up happening was really awesome. Uh, we accidentally created a meme. So uh, we turned the site into this. And with it, we created the meme Purpler. So I'm actually wearing my Purpler shirt right now. It says Purpler on the back. Um, and I think that actually went a really long way to getting buy-in for some reason, is people were really excited about this idea of getting a consistent experience together for our merchants. And we did this in three months. But the reason we were able to do it in three months wasn't because we had a big systems team that was doing all of the work. It was because we had convinced everybody that it was really important to do. And so they decided to take it on themselves. They paused projects that they were working on. They fitted in. They hijacked the things that they were doing. And they decided that they could do this together. So most of what we did was rely on the connections between individuals to make the changes. And this was really awesome. It was super successful. But like I said, this talk is not about success. <laughs> so. The first thing we really encountered is that systems, when they're built, tend to oppose their own functions. And we had two goals when we launched Polaris. Uh, the first of which I talked about, it was consistency between all of our products. It's really an external goal. It's really user facing. The second goal we had was an internal goal. We said we wanted to raise the quality of all of the work that was being produced at Shopify. And with that, some secondary effects would follow. We thought we would raise efficiency. We would do. Uh, what was the other one? Security? I like that one. We would raise security as well. And I think we thought all of these secondary effects would come from them, but we really wanted to target quality as our biggest thing because we were seeing lots of new people join and we wanted to make sure that quality bar stayed high. So we thought we would do that by creating and giving people clear steps on how to create great Shopify experiences. And we found that this mostly worked. The quality of our work increased. The consistency of our work definitely increased. Efficiency increased. It was all awesome. Except one thing happened that I really didn't expect. Uh, but creativity of our, in our work seemed to decrease in equal measure. This was weird. But I read this book, which is the book that uh, Julie put up there, which is called The Systems Bible. And in it, it references, uh, I think if I had gone to science, school for science, I probably would have found out with this one, but I didn't. Uh, so it references this rule, which is Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier states that systems always aim for equilibrium. So if something is out of balance in your system, it's going to try to do something to bring it back into balance. And so what we imagined was that by raising the quality floor, and this is why I wanted a hands-free mic, thanks, Julie, because uh, I just do this all the time. Um, by raising the quality floor, we would also be raising the quality ceiling. I thought like quality was this kind of static thing that we had the capacity for. And so if we just raised the floor, all of our work would get better uh, kind of over time, just continuously getting better. So overall quality should just increase over time as we improve the quality floor. But what really happened, and thanks to Lichtelia's principle, I know why now. But what really happened is by exerting pressure on the teams to follow the guides and use the system, we created an equal pressure to avoid novel solutions or out-of-the-box thinking. So what ended up happening was we kind of did this to our quality scale. We ended up producing much higher quality work, but the range in quality was a lot lower. We wouldn't get that like, new novel experiences or out-of-the-box thinking at any point. And so this isn't necessarily bad. Like This could be really good for you if you just need to increase your, your quality floor. But for me, it's really scary. Like I think Shopify uh, knows it needs to change in pretty drastic ways over the next five years to be really successful. And what I'm worried is that the design team will fall behind because we created this pressure on them. So th this was a quote I got about two weeks. No, well, maybe a little. Anyways, two weeks ago, let's say. Uh, it was from a product growth person 
uh, in the company, and he said, you spent so much time talking about making things the same, I assumed you never wanted them to change. And he told me this after I had explained kind of the different ways that I wanted our Shopify experience to change. And he was like, oh, I had no idea the UX team was interested in changing things, which is terrible. <laughs> it's a very terrifying statement to hear. Uh, and it made me realize that we didn't do a good enough job of explaining why we wanted the goal that we wanted when we released Polaris. We told everybody we wanted consistency, but what we really wanted was quality. So we didn't connect the goals for people. We didn't tell people what we wanted to get to after we launched the system. And what we really wanted is that quality elevator that I talked about, right? It's a floor that's constantly rising and a ceiling that's constantly rising with it. This elevates the entire company to do better work. So how do we get there? Well, we're trying, I mean, we're still struggling with this, but we're trying some new things. Uh, we introduced the idea of a concept car team. So this is a small team. It's two designers and a developer right now. And their job is to just produce novel concepts uh, for how the Shopify experience can change. Now, we don't plan on shipping any of the work that they produce. It's all just throwaway work. But their real goal is to inspire the rest of our teams to learn how to do conceptual work of their own. And this isn't a new concept. I mean, concept cars have been something that the uh, car industry have been doing for a really long time. But this is important for us because our teams feel like they have to spend so much of their time iterating on getting to the next feature release that they don't feel like they have the time to do this work. And this team is around to teach them how to do that work in the time that they have. I think that's really important. It's really exciting. The next lesson we learned is that if you're not careful, your system kind of just expands to take over literally everything. So I mean this. The, your system is going to start as this small thing, and you're like, OK, well, it just really represents our components or our UI. Uh, and then it kind of grows out a little bit more, and it grows out a little bit more. And all of a sudden, you're not sure if your system is your marketing design system, if it's your hardware design system. Is it your brand? Like, is, your, is Polaris our brand? I don't think so, but it might be. Um, so what we didn't do is set purposeful outlines for what we are and what we aren't doing with our design system. Because if you don't do that, basically what ends up happening is it kind of just reaches out in different places. And the people on your teams that are really interested in the system taking on more are going to reach out and take that ownership, which is good for them to do, but really hard for you to start to control the system. And this really uh, hurt us with the Polaris launch. So after the launch, like the six months afterwards, I think we were a little bit aimless. We didn't know exactly what we were looking to do with the system after that, and it was because we had just too many targets in front of us. So now we know Polaris is our merchant-facing design system, and we need a lot of other design systems to achieve the other things that we have. But we didn't set that boundary, uh, and I think it's a, it's a really important thing to do. So this is a, a smaller lesson. But systems appear more complete than they are. And I am continuing to learn this one, because I was talking to Ed right before this, and he was like, oh, I assumed you guys were on, what did you say, version? Uh, we said we were on version 1.1, and Ed was, thought we were much further along than we are. Um, we're not. We're still faking it, but that's OK. Uh, systems always appear more complete than they are. So from an outside perspective, your system is going to look a lot healthier than it is on the inside. And so as designers or as builders on the system, we all know what we're insecure about. We know what needs work. Um, I think the Eventbrite system uh, was cool. It showed like the incomplete or not sure kind of component list. We all know those things. But from the outside perspective, it kind of looks like everything's just done. And this one was interesting to me because it got used in a really weird way. So this is a quote from Kalig, uh, and I think he didn't mean it exactly the way that I took it. I think he meant it as a good thing, but this is the most terrifying thing I've ever read. <laughs> Uh, I was surprised that Toby uses Polaris as a source of alignment for the entire company. Toby is the CEO of Shopify, uh, and I don't know if I'm allowed to, whatever, I'm just going to say it. Uh, last year, we did a, a little bit of a reorg, and Toby used Polaris as the like, reason why we were ready to do it, which is scary. Like, we knew we weren't ready for that. We knew it wasn't ready to bear the weight of that on its shoulders. But from an outside perspective, it really looked like it was. So just. I don't even know what the lesson is on this one, other than be prepared for people to think you're much further along than you are, uh, and to bear the cost of that, whatever it is. Um, the next thing that we learned is that systems will attract systems people. So basically, when you create a design systems team, what you're going to do is you're going to create a little magnet where every systems thinker in your company is going to want to come join that team. So if you've got a systems team and you're like, I'm adding people to it, I'm hiring people, they're all going to put their hands up and be like, I want to work on that team. And you're going to say, sweet, I need people to work on my system, so that's awesome, and I really want systems thinkers to work on my system. And what ends up happening is that they all gravitate there. And then what you've done is you've basically removed all of the advocates for your system from the rest of the company. So you've pulled all of those systems people into one place where they can do a lot less good. 
Uh, this happened to us. It's uh, something that we continue to work on, but it's, it's a really, really difficult thing to deal with. And so the problem with only having systems thinkers on your team as well is that they try to solve everything with systems. And some things can't be solved with systems. Like the, the system isn't that good, it can't be. So what, we, what you need to do is uh, figure out ways that you can distribute your systems people back into the company if this does happen to you, or make sure that they stay out in the product uh, if you can. So one of the things that we've been trying is to take our systems designers especially and send them out to work on product teams. So uh, often they'll have a specific problem with the system that they're facing that they're not really sure how to solve. What we ask them to do is just identify a project that's happening that has an impact, kind of like the hijacking concept, has an impact on the system itself, and we send them out to do that. And these are usually like three to six month stints, but we find they're super useful because what ends up happening is they go out there, they learn how to work with the system instead of just on it, and they can bring all of that knowledge back to the team. So the other thing we try to do is run our systems team exactly the same way that our product teams are run. So we ask the team to spend as much time building user-facing features as they do building system features. So this means they're building a lot of our client experience features a lot of the time, but this is important because it means we have a product manager on the team, it means we have an engineering team as well, so we feel a lot like all of the other product design teams at Shopify. And this does a good job of kind of creating diversity of thought in the team. We balance that short-term thinking of uh, medium-term thinking of building products with that really long-term thinking of building systems. So there's a quote from Ian. And Ian was actually one of the maybe unlucky, maybe lucky first designers on that design system. Uh, he got disbanded three years ago. He got sent off into the world of product uh, and grew from there from an IC into now a senior lead at the company. And I think he was able to do that because he was able to apply his systems thinking to the product that he was working on and make some really big advances, which is really cool. So this is a concept that I think is really important to drill into your entire company. You have more of an impact building your system on the outside than you do on the inside. And this is something that we really try to build with Polaris as well, is uh, this idea that most of the work the systems team does is not contributing to the system. Most of the work the systems team does is just keeping it healthy, maintaining its uh, existence and <laughs> advocating for it and educating people on it. Most of the work that's going into the system actually comes from our product teams. And I think this does a good job of making sure that we're advancing at a steady pace. But steady paces are hard to accomplish. Uh, so one of the lessons we've also learned is that constant progress does not look like progress to anyone else. So most of the people in your company have way more important things to pay attention to than the latest component you released or the update that you made to your design system. So we build Polaris like we build Shopify. It's like a lot of just continuous small releases. We're just kind of pumping stuff out constantly. We don't really talk about it. It's just out there. You can update if you want to. You just kind of keep going. But this makes it really easy to not pay attention to anything that was happening. And I got this quote literally a week ago. We've been working on Polaris for 10 months. We have a big team of like 40 people. Um, I think, anyways, yeah, not great. Uh, so the lesson there is really, and really communicate regularly. Like tell people not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it, how you're doing it, what is going on. Because really, if you want people to be using your system, if you want people to be using your system correctly, they really need to understand how you're thinking about changing it, because otherwise you're just dropping stuff on them. And also they're probably not gonna pay that much attention. So we do monthly email updates. I don't think that's enough. We also do show and tells every two weeks with the entire core product team. Uh, we do office hours where you can kind of come and chat with us about what's changing. But the other thing I think we want to try, and we haven't tried this, this was a uh, test, is big named releases. So just every three months, putting together a bunch of posters or something like that, like rolling up all of the changes that we made to the system and doing a big announcement, maybe buying cake, I don't know. Just like getting it out there and saying, please listen to us, we have changed things, like come take a look at what we've changed, uh, because otherwise people just are gonna forget about it. The next thing is, and I promise there's not that many next things, uh, is it's, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. I think we all know this one, right? This is a pretty common rule. I hate this rule, this is the worst thing. Uh, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly, because with everything, what you end up doing, and especially on systems team, is getting into this perfectionist mindset. You go, okay, well if, we have a systems team that is four designers, and it's building things for a team of 300 people, and then 600,000 people rely on those things. Everything I release better be goddamn perfect. Like, really, really good. And that means you don't release anything, because it's never perfect. So what we need to do is get into a mindset where we're releasing these components constantly, talking about them constantly, so people understand what we're doing, and they're making constant progress. 
And the thing that made me realize this is that our most productive three months as a team were the three months where we set an impossible deadline. We said Polaris is coming out in three months. We didn't have time to make anything perfect. We just had to make it work. So this is still something that we struggle with. Uh, this was February 20th. Uh, and we were working on releasing, I'm going to try not to fall off the stage. Uh, we were working on releasing the, a new resource list component. So uh, Ryan is, I don't know if you can read this. Anyways, Ryan is getting a bunch of criticism back from uh, a user feedback banner. He's seeing a lot of concerns popping up about the component. And he's going, I think we should bring it back down to zero percent. It was at 25 percent. And the response is actually like, no, let's just ship it to 100. We can fix these things later. Uh, none of what he found was going to ruin anyone's life. Uh, and afterwards, Matt, our researcher, posted this really nice comment, which is he analyzed the feedback. 54% were positive about the functionality of the resource list. Uh, for comparison's sake, only 29% of merchants were positive about our release of Polaris. So we did great. Um, but this thing, comparatively, was actually really awesome. Um, but it's really hard to see that from the inside. So it's a hard mentality to get out of, but it's really important that you don't try to perfect everything. Uh, this one is an interesting one. Uh, your system kind of tends, I said this at the beginning, tends to take on a life of its own. So the weird thing about this is that it takes more people to just keep your system alive than it did to build it in the first place. So like Ed was one person building the system. I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for Dropbox, but I bet that team has to grow just to keep the system going. It certainly did for us. Systems kind of work to maintain their own health. You end up thinking about things like organizational structure, or if you're like us, naming the team for a month or something like that. Uh, just these weird bureaucratic sh that shows up because your team grows and grows. Um, and you end up spending like so much time on it, you don't spend the time on the output. So we've grown the team, the team's gotten bigger, but it kind of feels like we get less done overall. And I think the reason for that is twofold. Part of it is because we spend a lot of our time on advocacy and support now. We don't spend it building the system, and I think that's actually the right thing to do. But the other side of it is I think we uh, introduced a little bit too much structure too quickly. We didn't think about the best ways for our system to evolve on its own. So Dom uh, is a poor soul who has a lot of people on his team, but um, doesn't feel like he's getting as much done as he would like to. Uh, I'm sorry, Dom, because he's going to watch this, I know. Uh, so the last thing, I promise it's the last one, is uh, really thinking about this in terms of evolution. So the real rule is in order to remain unchanged, the system has to change. And, and what I mean by this is if you want your system to keep working the way it's working right now, it needs to look entirely different than what it looks like a month from now. So your system needs to keep changing just to keep doing the same things. And an example of this is all of the problems I just listed. These are all actually really awesome for us to figure out, really awesome for us to learn, because it means we can feed them back into the system and change the way that it works to account for them. So for us, most of this has been about focusing less on the what and how we build what we build, so less about the components or even the architecture, and more about the why we build what we build. It's kind of coming back to that original thing I was talking about with the small systems team, just getting everybody to understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. Because I don't really care if you use a button that looks like another button. I mean, sure, that's important. What I really want you to do is understand why we make those decisions, because then you can make those decisions for yourself. Like it's not, you don't need a systems team to tell you what to do. And even though the tools are not the system, you can actually help this with some good tooling. So uh, Ed mentioned Abstract. We use it as well. It's awesome. I fucking love it. Um, I'm trying to, I don't, maybe I'm, I'm going to lose friends here, but I'm trying to get rid of Envision at Shopify. I love Abstract. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, <laughs> and um, what's great about it is that every single project at Shopify is in abstract. The designers can look at every single thing that's happening. Uh, they can submit comments, they can submit PRs, they can do whatever to the UI kit, but they can also pull that out into their own work and they can stick specific examples in. It's a really great way to have the entire team collaborating together again in a way that we never had before. We also have a lot of great developer tools uh, that Kalig builds. So if you want to talk about developer tools, talk to this guy, um, that are awesome, that help our developers work better together, which is super important as we're transitioning from a Rails-based interface to a React-based interface. Uh, we really need these tools to kind of help ev keep everybody in sync. So right now, we have two code bases, and it kind of sucks. Um, the other thing that's really exciting is we're launching a new version of Polaris in May. Uh, so this is another one of those moments where I'm saying we're doing something. Uh, maybe the team doesn't know about it, but maybe they do. Um, I think they do because they did a sprint last week. Um, it's still exploratory, but it's really focusing around this concept of why we design the way that we design at Shopify instead of what we design at Shopify, which is really awesome. I think you'll see it in May. All hopes on that. Um, 
So in closing, your system isn't your tools. Your system isn't anything. Your system is really a formal implementation of practices that your team already follows. So if you're talking to each other already, if you already like, know why you design the way that you design, if you're two designers and you sit beside each other, you probably don't need a formal system. And I would actually encourage you to do most of your work without a system, if you can, without those formal implementations, because it'll make it way easier to change it as you need to. It's just not worth all of the costs that come with systems if you don't need to introduce them. But sometimes you do need a system. And in those cases, what I would really encourage is that you use a small one and you really focus it on what the specific problem you're trying to solve is. So like, put the boundaries on it, make sure that it's the right thing and that you're building your system for the right reasons. And also, make sure you're focused on involving people across your organization in it and having the conversation with them about what's right and what's wrong. Because again, your system isn't the rules, your system is just some weird abstraction of what's actually happening in your company. And that's the important thing to capture with it. The last point is if you need a big system, make sure it's feeding back on itself to change in positive ways. And what I mean by that is take all of the shit that you're getting every single day about what's wrong with your system and use it. Make sure you're changing your system every single day to account for all of those uh, negatives and turn them into a really great positive thing. So for us, uh, we, we kind of lost sight of our long-term goals in favor of some short-term goals when we launched Polaris, and that's never gonna happen to us again, fingers crossed, but uh, it's a really risky thing, I think. So my experience is definitely not gonna be your experience. Shopify is a very different company than a lot of companies. You might be a small company, you might just be starting out with your design system. You might be a big company, you might have an established design system. All of our systems are gonna kick back in slightly different ways. What I would love to do is have a conversation with you about the way that your system's kicking back, because I think Shopify's ways are unique to it, but maybe you share them as well. I would love to hear kind of all of those, those different things, so please send me a tweet. I'm not on Twitter that much, but I will respond. Oh, those are my cats. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll stop for the cats, they're cute. That's Earl and that's Gary, they're adorable. Um, sorry, okay, what was I saying? Uh, Twitter, kpete, uh, or just send me an email, kalepete.shopify.com, or just talk to me here. I think we have some time after this, uh, after the Q&A. Uh, I would love to hear all of the different ways that your system is failing you and what we can do to work on them. And also, we're like hiring like crazy, um, so please come join us if you want to. We're in Canada, which is fun. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.